COVID in China and the effect of COVID in China on uh, China's economy. Very important. And for this discussion, we have Carl Baker, who is a senior advisor at the Pacific Forum, um, who is going to tell us what's going on over there and how it affects the economy, the politics, and China's global mm, reputation. And of course, it's also its reputation with North Korea. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting interesting topic, and and it's an evolving topic, and it also has become a very political topic. I think in the United States, where there's a there's a certain eagerness to show that uh, this time China is going to fail, you know, and and I think that's that's almost the underlying narrative of of some of the reports when it says uh, COVID the Chinese COVID policy is unsustainable. You know, and and this is this is the, this is certainly the narrative that's coming from the U.S. But then, when when they're successful, then that narrative kind of dies down a little bit until the next time it comes up. <laughs> and so and so, where are we? I think that's that's kind of where what we want to accomplish today is where are we? You know, and and as you were mentioning just before the just before the show, is you know, in 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 very stark terms, what's happened is China has fewer than or somewhere around five thousand deaths. And of course, you know, the United States just recently marked their one millionth death, you know, and so really look at the contrast, you know, in, in if, if you want to, if you want to hear it from the Chinese narrative, we're interested, we're protecting people's lives, you know, and of course, from the American narrative, this can't be sustainable if, because, because now they have the Omicron variant, uh, you know, five, six, whatever the number is today. And they and they simply can't keep doing this. And I think there's truth in both sides of that story. Yeah. Well, very interesting. I mean, you know, if you if you look at it just as um, uh, had Xi Jinping been the president of the United States, uh, we would be better off today. Uh, in his own way, he has respected the science. Um, during mm -hmm. the Trump administration, we were not respecting the science. Uh, and even now, people, you know, are they politicized vaccines and masks? It's terrible. I just came back from a trip to the East Coast, and I, I would say maybe a quarter or a third of the people on the street were wearing masks and in public places. Yeah. Um, you know, we shoot ourselves in the foot, and then we wonder why we get sick. Um, but in China, you know, or if Xi Jinping was the president of the United States, it wouldn't be like that. They'd all be wearing masks. I remember seeing a photograph, Carl, of um, the um, the virus, the the, the flu of uh, 1918, 1918, 1919, and there's a woman holding a sign, and and it says, uh, "Wear a mask or go to jail." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's well, and that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, if you if you think about it, you know, I was I was reading an article in Asia Times, and you know, it said had. To, to, to say if, if Xi Jinping had been president, had China followed the U.S., it would have now 4 million deaths. And it said, had the U.S. followed China, it would only have 1,300 deaths. You know, so, so those, that's kind of the starkness of that contrast that, that uh, you know, and, and in some ways, it does follow the larger narrative about the United States and China, that the United States is going to demand individual freedom. It's going to it's going to skew to the side of, of individual liberties. And China is going to skew to the side of social responsibility, of, of protecting, protecting the larger society and compromise the, uh, the the individual freedoms of the individual. And that's kind of what you're saying about about the woman carrying the sign is is that that sign only works in the United States. You don't see that sign in China. So then the question is, is how, how much societal pressure is there in China to change the policy? And you know, then we always go back, the, the American articles always go back and they talk about, yeah, you know, in, on Weibo, you know, the, the sort of Chinese version of Twitter, people are really complaining, they're unhappy, but there's no, there's no organized opposition. It's it's individuals are unhappy and and they and they are being held prisoner in their own homes. But there's not anything more than that. There's no organized rallies. There's no organized uh, resistance to to the policies of the government. 
Yeah, it's uh, anecdotal. Um, and it's Western, the Western press gets the story and they, and they make it sound pretty bad. And they, they quote um, Chinese people as saying, we want freedom and liberty and democracy and all this. Um, but the fact is that there's a very low rate of death. Uh, and yeah. I don't, uh, you know, it's, they, they come from the same place that some of the people in the United States come from. Their, you know, their freedom and liberty and, and death is more important than trying to protect your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I find it very interesting that, that is, that's, that's a global kind of thing that exists yeah. in large part in the U.S., but also in a smaller part in China. And I, I'm not sure that I would criticize the Xi Jinping all that much on this. He may be going off the side a little bit. Maybe he could cool it once in a while and not hold people hostage the way he does. Um, but I think in, in general, the concept is, is good. Yeah, well, and, and again, you know, I think th there is some, some indication that they're moving away from it. You know, I mean, in, in this latest in this latest iteration, now uh, you know now we have another lockdown in Anhui, which is halfway between Shanghai and Wuhan. You know, so now that's in that area, and then also, as you were saying, up in Xi'an, there's a there's a lockdown in Xi'an because they've found new new cases up there, and and so this becomes more and more difficult to sustain as as you have these variants, and now and now the the problem for China becomes how do you how do you reach that herd immun immunity, which everybody else in the world had, you know, because if you look in Southeast Asia, they've dropped all the travel restrictions, they've, they've dropped many of the of the controls that still are in place in China. And, and in the West, of course, you know, we, we've dropped those requirements. And so how does, how does this end? You know, at what point does, does China accept the fact that it has to allow these variants to infect the, the society? You know, with as long as they refuse, continue to refuse to to take the mRNA vaccines from the West, they're going to have this problem that that they are relying more on testing than they are on vaccines. You know, and so you know, another part of the story in China, of course, is that they've they've put together a machine that allows them to test up to a half a, of a half a billion people in forty eight hours. You know, you think about think about the the amount of time and energy. Put into that testing program that they've put into place, and and that's where they're spending their money. That's where they're spending their their resources is on the testing in, rather in than Shanghai, on the Shanghai, they're spending ten million dollars a day yeah. in these uh, semi permanent testing facilities and requiring yeah. everybody to go down every couple of days um, to get tested, which is really what you know. One you mentioned um, that the mRNA you know vaccines have not been accepted. Uh, China, China has some kind of um, uh, limitation. I mean, they don't accept the Western vaccines, and they and their vaccines are still in a trial. Their mRNA vaccines are still in trial, mm -hmm. so nobody in China gets to use them. And we all know, or at least I I've seen it many times, that the Chinese vaccines are not as good, right. they're not as current, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. they don't work as well. And and you know that's a really silly thing that uh, Xi Jinping is doing, he should allow the mRNA vaccines in, he should buy them, he should stroke the West, you know, compliment the West for having done them. Um, we're ahead of him on that, and not to say that enough people in this country take them, but he could use those things and, and, and hold the rates down. If he wants to do that, that's what, if he wants to hold the rates down, he should take the vaccine. Well, you see, and I think that's where the, that's where the dilemma is coming. And and it and it fits into this larger pattern of of the technology competition between China and the United States, where increasingly the United States doesn't want to doesn't want to share technology. China doesn't want to accept the Western technology, you know. And so and so you're seeing you're seeing the economic displacement occurring in China, but not to the extent that the United States would have expected, and not just because of the virus, but because of this larger trend between the two in competition over technology. Yeah. So propaganda is a big part of this. I mean, he said zero, zero COVID, um, hell or high water, zero COVID. We, we find a couple of cases here or there where he'll lock you down. Um, and he doesn't want any, and, and, and he says, this is effective. This is working. Yep. This is an example of how 
the Chinese system is better than the West. And yep. if you if you speak if you speak contrary to that, you say anything or write anything, uh, or in the case of North Korea, they released a video which was being played in in China about how they were doing so well, which I'm not sure I believe anyway. Um, China squashed that, took it off, yep. uh, and it can't be played. And so he, you know, he, it's a it's a, again a propaganda war, and he's determined to make China look good, even if it's not entirely true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's and that that again, that's the dilemma. Is is it's difficult to to see exactly what what where the truth lies, you know? Uh, to what extent do we over over emphasize the downsides of it, and to what extent are they underplaying what's really happening? And and it's it's really really difficult to to determine what, which is the right answer because we're as much influenced by some of that propaganda as as the Chinese are. So I have a question for you, Carl. Hmm. Um, this propaganda war around this, this politicization of uh, of COVID and medicine, um, it, would it exist in China if it had not existed in the United States first? Uh, I don't. I don't think I understand the question. Are you okay. saying the, the, the problem? COVID, COVID, and anti-COVID medicine has been politicized. It's been made the subject of, of propaganda for sure, and he is uh, expressing that globally. Um, but we had it. We had the politicization of COVID early on, um, and in okay. the Trump administration, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and it became very politicized to the point where half the country, you know, just like half the country thinks that. Uh, that Trump won the election, and uh, half the country yeah. thinks that 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 uh, it's just a sniffle. Yeah. Now, I, now I get get the the intent. Um, well, yeah. I, but I, yes and no. I mean, because I think I think both sides were were going to politicize it from the beginning, and and what we've seen is how each side has politicized it is slightly different. You know. So so. Again, it goes back to this this increasing competition between the United States and China. And really, if you go back to the beginning, it it starts when you know when yeah when when we start talking about the Wuhan virus, you know, and and the China virus, you know, and all the stuff that that occurred early on in the Trump administration. But on its own, China was always prepared to to, I think, develop its own narrative about how they were addressing the the. Uh, virus and and that plays into this larger again this larger competition between technology uh development in china versus technology development in the united states so the answer to the question is i think it would have happened regardless of how we played it out early in the united states because china was was also in recognizing this this increasing competition in technology and that's only exacerbated it and so now we have these these uh, discussions about China, uh, supply chain resilience and and the ability to to work around Chinese supply chains. And I think that that all is part of this this increasing competition between uh, China and the United States over over technology. Well, you know, it's 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 more than the rhetoric. And this, he has some good arguments. I mean, for example, we've known about the Omicron now for months. And yet we don't we don't have um, any Omicron vaccines. They won't be ready until the fall. I mean, uh, ideally. And, uh, um, you know, if we had great medicine and great vaccines, we'd be ready already. Um, we, we're supposed to be advanced on that. And I don't think it's a it's a bad argument for him to say, you know, the the, the sleeping giant over there, the United States can't seem to um, get get the vaccines to comport with the latest version. Um, of, of, of the of, of the uh, of the variants. The other thing that he could argue, which I think successfully, is that we we have this mm, political divide in the country where you know half the people in the country don't want to don't want to do anything scientific. They don't believe it, um, and that you know that's a, a sign of the weakness of America. Um, so you know he can make some good arguments. He can make some good comparisons. Uh, oh. he, he he shuts the city down. It's no fool around. And if you believe that that helps, it does. It, he can make it happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the statistic we started off with is is compare the number of deaths in one versus the other, and and that approach works. 
but at what cost to, to society? In the United States, we say, oh, you can't do that because you're, you're impinging on individual freedoms and, and you're, you're creating a, a powerful uh, administrative state. You know, all the things that you've just heard in the last couple of weeks about what's happening in the Supreme Court. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it absolutely comes right back to, to that whole mindset in the United States of, of individual freedoms, where in China, there are individual freedoms are only uh, after you've satisfied the societal requirements to ensure a stable uh, government. So, you know, the, the, these, these historical trends will modify. Over time, I think people will learn that, I'm, I'm just a speculation, but I, people will learn that they really have to wear a mask and take a vaccine, not only for COVID, for anything else that comes down the pike, yeah. if they want to protect themselves um, by protecting the community. And China will learn, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, if there's ever a successor to Xi Jinping, will learn <clears throat> it's probably better to you know, relax a little and, and not shut people down and lock them up over this sort of thing and take such draconian steps that they complain about it. I mean, don't you think that ultimately the, the two approaches will each resemble each other more? Well, they won't resemble each other, but they'll converge. They'll converge yeah. from, from, from the different poles. And, you yeah. know, and I think that's right. I think that, that you know, there, there is still a recognition in parts of the United States. And some, some Americans realize that you do have to take some precautions to prevent infection. And, and you know, the vaccine isn't going to do everything for you. You do still need to be careful in, in, in close settings and things like that. And, and I think increasingly, you know, China is, is giving indications that as, as people aren't getting as sick anymore, you know, once, once they have their virus closer, I think then you start seeing them move a little bit more towards, towards that convergence point where they will accept a few, a few cases that they don't have to test the entire city of Shanghai every 48 hours to make sure that they don't have a, a case of a mild case of, of uh, the Omicron variant, whatever the number is today. It's interesting that there's not all that much uh, vaccination going on in China. And what he has done as a matter of policy is to focus on masks and quarantine and testing, but yeah, well, not, not necessarily yeah. vaccines. Yeah, you know, and, and I mean, and that's, China is contract tracing God mad. You know, if you look at, if you look at all the options we, that were available from the beginning of this, you know, it's so, it's so clear that China took one path and the United States took the vaccine path. You know, and, and now you have, you, as you say, we're gonna end up converging back away from these extremes at some point. And, and the question is, is can we really find a way uh, to cooperate in that process. And, and to me, it's not at all clear we can, simply because uh, this, 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 this divergence has, has been exacerbated or, and it has exacerbated the, the trend of moving away from each other in terms of supply chain. So, so then the, the real larger question for China-US relations is how does this affect trade? You know, and what we're seeing today from the, from the Biden administration is more and more talk about moving away from 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 uh, the the sanctions and talking about building resilient supply chains that that exclude China. And so now we're looking at at some of the economic implications of of what this means is that we're not going to we're not going to go back and say okay now we're going to re-engage China because the 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 Different paths that we've taken in this in this uh, pandemic has forced us into a further path away from each other in coordinating economic policies, and I think that that's going to continue, and that's going to make that convergence that could have occurred in the in the uh, resolving the, the pandemic into a, a broader difference between China and the U.S. in terms of, of economic policy and and trade policy. Yeah, I mean, that's a sort of an optimistic um, result of all of this, that, I mean, if, 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 you looked, if you looked at losing a million souls here in the United States, you know that's going to affect the economy. If you look at hospitals being full and people being out of work and having to stay home, you know that's going to affect the economy, and it has. I mean, you can blame 
you know, oil prices and Putin and whatnot. But, you know, I think we, I think we knew that our economy um, would, would have issues and difficulties uh, when COVID first started. It was an easy prediction. Yeah. And likewise, likewise for China right now, if you, you're going to shut down Shanghai or Xi'an or any of those other cities and make everybody stay at home and not go to work, um, you know that's going to have an effect on the economy. And if, if you have um, you know, aberrations in the supply chain because of all that, you know global trade will be affected. So, I, I mean, I think it's perfectly reasonable for the two leaders to come together and say, wouldn't we both be better off if we stopped uh, attacking each other, if we started to work together on this? But I don't see that happening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't see that happening because what I see what I see happening is you know today today's news is about about the Biden administration clearly is getting ready they're talking about a high level meeting between uh, between the foreign minister and uh, and uh, Anthony Blinken again uh, and it's it's clear that we're going to move away from sanctions but what's what's also clear is that the United States with with its Indo Pacific economic framework. And China continuing to push the the regional comprehensive economic uh, uh, partnership, and trying to join uh, the the comprehensive uh, and progressive uh, what what is a Trans Pacific partnership, you know the the free trade agreements. The United States is moving away from it. The United States is saying we're setting our own standards, and 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 technology is going to be hands off. We're not going to give access to to advanced technology. China is going to China is saying that's fine because we're going to continue to push free trade because free trade is in our interest. And so we have we have this divergence, this economic divergence, and, and the pandemic has only exacerbated it. It's exacerbated it by the by the fact that the United States and others have taken the taken the, the pandemic as part of the rationale for moving supply chains out of China. So so now you've you've lost that that China as the as the central hub for Western uh, imports, and and you've moved it to Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. So I, you know, I, I think that that it 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 could have it could have resulted in a, a better opportunity for cooperation. But I think what's happening instead is both sides have said we can't afford to to take that risk. We're going to continue to pursue alternative uh, approaches to economic uh, security. So here's a hard question for you, Carl. Given all of that, especially given the COVID element in it, who comes out ahead? Yeah, that is a hard question because I don't think there's a there's a straightforward answer at this point. I think I think both sides are are deeply committed to the path that they're on, to the point where in some ways they're they're a bit irrational because they they've convinced themselves that they can't afford to cooperate and and so uh, you, you know whose whose side is history on uh, is it is is it really to the point where where we have to think about about isolation uh, national security interests based on on economic trade or is it is it to the point where where China is is going to become the dominant economy because it's going to maintain free trade because it sees it as as the solution to its problem. Yeah, how is and, um, and how I'm not is answering Belton, the question. <laughs> uh, no, I have no answer. I I, I I guess it's how you play the game. Um, <clears throat> and it's it's every day on its own merits. Um, and uh, we we know that um, COVID has. Uh, damage the economy of both places. I, yeah. uh, I would, I, my own guess would be that it's damaged our economy in the U.S. more than it's damaged uh, the Chinese economy, even though they really don't like being shut down in all those cities. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if you look at, if you look at the numbers, you know, the the World Bank put out some some numbers that said that yeah, China got hurt, but it didn't get hurt as bad as the United States. That's exactly what they're saying. And if you look at at the 2020 versus 2021, uh, China China still has has a, a a booming export economy, but can it really can it really uh, resolve all this all this uh, 
departure of, of economic uh, activity due to COVID. I mean, you know, if you, if you look at one of the other numbers that I've, that I've seen is that they're saying that uh, foreign direct investment is down in China. They're saying that, that uh, foreign companies uh, have, have left and they haven't renewed some of their, uh, some of their uh, uh, operations on, in the, on the East Coast, you know, where, where COVID has been, a, has been a problem. So, you know, so, so some of those things suggest that, in fact, uh, China is going to get hurt. Uh, but clearly, the United States is getting hurt uh, from, from inflation, from, from disrupted uh, supply chains. Uh, and, and then, of course, you, you pile all the other things going on in the world on top of it. Uh, and, and it becomes a real challenge, I think, for the, uh, for the West to, to see their way clear to, to return to economic growth when you're excluding a large part of, uh, of, of, of the population in China. I mean, you're basically trying to run an economy and you're ignoring 1.5 billion people in China. That's, that's going to become very difficult. Yeah. And, 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 and who knows how much more difficult in the next few years. Um, well, now, what about the sanctions? You mentioned that this administration was thinking about, has indicated that it would uh, relax the sanctions. And I, I guess that means the tariffs mostly. Um, yeah. Yeah. What, what's the benefit to us and what's the detriment uh, to us and what's the benefit and detriment to China? Well, not surprisingly, you know, the, the United States has now come to the realization that we knew from the beginning that tariffs are inflationary, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the, the, the Trump administration knew this and they did it anyway. And they said, oh, because the, the Chinese companies are going to lower their price to, to re retain access. Well, it's very clear now that as we knew it was going to happen, what happened is, of course, the prices were increased in the United States for somebody to pay for the tariffs. So that's, you know, so in, in some ways it's beneficial. And, and the Biden administration, I think, is doing this in, in its efforts to reduce inflation. You know, China, on the other hand, uh, is, is, is going to get away with not ever fulfilling its commitments to the, the promises it made to the Trump administration for increasing imports. You know, if you look at the latest import export numbers from, from China, their imports haven't gone up dramatically, but their exports have been pretty consistent. So I think that, that uh, in, the, in the long run, China probably benefits from, from the lifting of sanctions. But the counter to that, of course, is, is how impactful will the, these new ideas about uh, about supply chain resilience going to be to what extent, and that and then it becomes a question of how effective is this this Indo-Pacific economic framework going to be in setting standards and reaching agreements in in Asia over how to how to govern digital technology, how to how to govern the digital economy, and how to actually uh, ensure you have resilient supply chains that exclude China, and to what extent can you do that? And to what extent are the Asian countries going to be willing to play along with that sort of approach when, in fact, they're, they're playing both sides off by, by joining the economic uh, partnerships with China and promising to at least work with the United States on some aspects of the Indo-Pacific economic framework? Now, Carl, we haven't talked about the uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative, which is very ambitious. Uh, which uh, represents a kind of manifest destiny um, of for China and um, a huge step forward, at least theoretically, all the way to Spain and Portugal and what have you. Uh, how 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 has how has COVID affected? How has the economic changes in China resulting from COVID affected the success, uh, the move, the forward motion of Belt and Road? Uh, it's it's hard to say uh, how to how to isolate the the COVID effect on it, but um, clearly what what China is realizing is through inflation, through bad management, a lot of the projects aren't finished, will probably never get finished. There's a lot of there's a lot of bad debt sitting out there because of it. So you've got these countries that that signed on to Belt and Road. And and you're you're dating yourself by saying one belt one road. Remember, China sort of figured out 
about two years in that that probably wasn't a good way to characterize it. And so yes. they went to with the Belt and Road Initiative. Yes, yes, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and so I think, you know, what what people sort of anticipated is happening that that now you've got, uh, you know, the G7, of course, just last week, you know, signed on to the American proposal to uh, what, $600 billion or something, I think, was the number that got floated about uh, investment uh, to counter Belt and Road. But of course, when you go looking for somebody to take on that that uh, that that uh, debt that occurs when you do an infrastructure project, uh, they're all sitting in not very good shape because they're in, in debt to China over some of the projects that are never going to get finished. So now you've got you know you've got uh, in developing countries with a debt load that isn't going to allow them to do much. And so Belt and Road is still there. You know, it's still, again, everybody says, yeah, that's great if you want to give us infrastructure, but uh, pay for it? Well, that's a that's problematic. <laughs> you know, yeah. so you have to so, follow but, but, the but, money. <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, Belt and Road was was extremely successful for its the first years because everybody said, wow, this is great. We're, we're expanding the economy. You know, we're, we're, we're getting all this free money. Well, of course, money is never free. You know, there's always a cost and, and th those costs are coming due. And then the question becomes, can, you know, can China really, really do anything with that debt? I mean, it's one thing to, to talk about taking over ports in Sri Lanka, but, uh, you know, are you really going to do that? Because it's just, that's just chasing, you know, that's just pushing bad money after bad money. Yeah, a hole uh, in the some, water that, into that, which that, you pour money. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just it gets to be a, a problem. So you know, so so yeah, I mean, I think that that Belt and Road is is becoming problematic for them. You know, I mean, their property market is bad. It's, has they have a problem with their property market? They've got uh, they've got property companies that are are basically shells that are, are uh, you know zombie zombie companies that are living off uh, the largesse of the Chinese government. So you know, so you've got. You've got all the things that we have kind of in a different way that you've got a huge amount of money being put into testing. You've got a huge problem with debt. You've still got this, this uh, idea that you have to do something for the developed world. And uh, there's not a lot of room for maneuver. So, you know, uh, yeah, China isn't in, in great shape, but uh, the West, as I say, you look at the West and they're sort of in the same, same kind of situation where you 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 want to help the developing countries, but you've got you've got no way to, to service all the debt that's been accumulated up front. One of the things that's been in the in the press uh, is um, uh, Xi Jinping's current attention to Hong Kong, with the two flags flying together, um, and uh, you know the essential propaganda statement. We, we wanted to bring them into into line with Chinese policy and uh, sovereignty, and we have we, we've succeeded. Uh, how, is that true? And how does it how does it play with the economy of China? Well, I, I mean, Hong Kong Hong Kong is a, somewhat of a specific case in in China because you know with with the draconian measures for the lockdown, you know, the Western companies that have been sort of sustaining Hong Kong as a as a financial center, you know, the 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 Western you couldn't get anybody to come in and work those those senior positions in Hong Kong. So you, you, you're, you've really lost a lot of the momentum for Hong Kong as a financial center. And, and that's going to be very difficult to get back because they've moved out most uh, all over, mostly to Singapore, but also to Japan, to some extent to Taipei. You know, so, so you've, you've lost that momentum. Uh, uh, but, you know, so, so I, I think that, that again, that's a, a point of, of loss for China. Well, I, I wanted also to ask you about Ukraine, but I think we're out of time. And if you don't mind, we'll have to we'll have to treat that separately, Carl, as another show, because that is having a global effect, not only on China, certainly the U.S. and Western Europe, um, but uh, the implications of Ukraine and the continuation of the war there. I would really like to have another show with you and soon. Yeah, and and I think that 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 that's another another aspect of this. And of course, there China is is kind of the junior partner in some ways of 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 the of the problem for the United States. And so it's a, yeah, that's an interesting and another interesting angle of how this whole competition between China and the U.S. plays out because because Ukraine 
creates a, its own set of problems. So you have COVID, you have Ukraine, you know, you have you have this this fear, this growing fear of a re, of inflation. But right around the corner is is uh, uh, recession. You know, so yeah, so it all plays into I think a larger picture of of a very rapidly changing international environment. Yeah, and um, this is only one day after July 4th, Carl. I guess I'll, I'll close with asking you, you know, how you felt and how you feel about July 4th in these very tumultuous and problematic times. As my, as my daughter told me yesterday, I guess we've seen the real July 4th celebration in Chicago. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, and I say that only because you know I mean that that's almost become emblematic of of, of what, what's happening I think in in the United States that uh, that July four is isn't isn't sacred anymore either that we we still have mass shootings even on July four yeah and fireworks has taken on a different meaning yeah <laughs> thank you Carl Carl Baker senior advisor of Pacific Forum who joins us from time to time to discuss these very important issues, issues about which you should be educated. Thank you so much, Carl. I look forward to our next discussion. Yeah, thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.